Uh, thank you all for attending today's webinar. Uh, just going to do a brief introduction before Rohit starts. So, um, my name is Nick, and um, I'm the support specialist with Eddie Instruments. Uh, today, I am joined by my colleagues uh, Amy Chi and uh, Pamela Kacha, both uh, senior um, sales specialists with um, Eddie Instruments. Um, just a few housekeeping rules before we begin. Um, you can ask questions in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, if it's something that is quite trivial, uh, our team will answer them for you properly. Otherwise, just wait till the end of the webinar and uh, Rohit uh, will be able to answer them. So without further ado, um, we are here obviously joined by our guest um, and our lead speaker, Dr. Rohit Ramchandra. Uh, this, is, this webinar will be titled Pressure and Flow Rate Studies in Large Animals. Uh, for Dr. Rohit, uh, throughout his career, he has been interested in the mechanisms controlling sympathetic nerve activity during normal physiology and during pathophysiology conditions. He undertook his PhD at the Department of Physiology, University of Auckland, investigating the role of sympathetic nervous system and nitric oxide in the control of blood pressure. He is interested in the possibility that the differential control of sympathetic nerve activity may be regulated by four brain areas led him to under undertake his postdoctoral studies at the Florey Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health. Together with his mentor, Professor Clive May, he published numerous papers investigating the reflex control of directly recorded cardiac sympathetic nerve activity in heart failure. He relocated back to Auckland in 2014, where he is running his own lab investigating autonomic control of the circulation in ovine models of hypertension and heart failure. So with that further ado, Abrahit, you can take it from here. I'll just uh, stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Nick. Um, sorry, I can't share my screen at the moment. Just looking into this now. Okay, you can try that one. Great, thank you. Um, and I'll just confirm you guys can see my PowerPoint slides? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll just start by thanking Nick um, and Amy, um, who both kind of um, very um, graciously invited me to talk a little bit about my studies. Um, so as from the introduction, um, I've done a lot of studies, mainly in the cardiovascular space. Um, and one of my big interests is an in autonomic control of the circulation. Um, but in the last maybe four to five years, um, while I'm still interested in autonomic nerves uh, and autonomic nerve activity, um, blood flow has become quite a big part of uh, my research questions. Um, and so I'm gonna give um, a little bit about a background about uh, measuring blood pressure and blood flow, um, and then go on to talk a little bit about um, some of my work um, that's using these tools to try and answer um, what I think are incredibly important research questions. Um, and so just a brief outline of the seminar. Um, the first bit might be incredibly basic in general, um, but I'm just going to um, raise um, the rationale that most people would have, and definitely I have, uh, for measurement of arterial pressure as plus blood flow. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, tips for implantation of these pressure probes, um, as well as talk a little bit about instrumentation for these flow probes. Um, I'm not going to go into too much in depth about either of these, um, because I think there are a lot of other um, incredibly helpful tips, both from AD Instruments, um, as well as from other companies or manufacturers who um, for example, for transonic that really cover um, instrumentation that's quite specific to different animal models. Um, I'll then go on to move to talk about um, a model of heart failure and how one of the tools, um, which is arterial pressure, was used to try and get some data uh, and then move on to um, um, an ovine model of renovascular hypertension um, and kind of highlight how the use of the transonic flow probes really kind of helped answer some important research questions. 
So arterial pressure effectively reflects the combined effect of both the force of the heart. Um, in other words, the amount of blood ejected from the heart, um, as well as the resistance of the vasculature. Um, if you are a cardiovascular scientist, you're interest, interested in cardiovascular um, physiology, I think measurement of arterial pressure is incredibly important. Uh, and it tells you a lot about the state of the cardiovascular system. Um, historically, arterial pressure is measured either indirectly or directly. Um, and by directly, I mean effectively having a catheter um, that sits inside the artery that can directly measure pressure. Um, if you are an experimental scientist, which is what I am, um, I think it becomes, um, especially if you use animal models of um, cardiovascular disease, uh, it's becoming incredibly hard, I think, to publish stuff um, where you might have indirect measures of arterial pressure. Um, the discussion around whether indirect measures of arterial pressure is as good as direct um, is kind of long, and I'm not going to go into that, um, but I, I certainly believe, and so do a lot of people, um, that I think if um, arterial pressure is one of your outcome variables, you really need to be measuring it directly. Uh, and the direct measurements, measurements traditionally have included a fluid-filled catheter, um, and this works incredibly well for a lot of situations. Um, this is something that I have used as well for a long period of time. Uh, but more recently, you have solid-state catheters, but effectively the pressure is measured um, at the tip of the catheter and doesn't require the catheter to be filled with fluid. Um, the choice that you use really depends on the experimental paradigm um, and quite importantly, at least in my case, the time course of measurement or the time course of the experimental paradigm. Um, so just to highlight, this is just an example of uh, a fluid for one metric catheter. Um, in other words, you've got a catheter that sits inside um, the arterial side um, circulation, um, which is connected to um, which is connected to this end, and effectively this membrane here um, transduces changes in pressure hitting the membrane and converts it to an electrical signal, which they can then uh, view in any program that you require. If your experimental per paradigm is quite short, uh, for example, if it's an acute anesthetized experiment, or even if it's a conscious experiment, but the period that you record pressure is quite short, um, you can probably very easily get away with a fluid filled manometric catheter. Um, the issue becomes if you're using a fluid filled arterial pressure catheter, um, is that over time, as um, there is some clot that builds up um, in that really tiny tube, effectively the transduction of the pressure is not as reliable. Um, and here's just an example at the bottom um, of an animal that we had a fluid filled catheter in. And you can see at times this very clear arterial pressure where you can see the dichrotic notch. Um, and at times, effectively, you lose it. Um, what you find in these scenarios is that if you flush the catheter quite repeatedly, um, you can get to a point where you see really good um, output of your arterial pressure trace, but that tends to diminish over time. And usually that reflects a decreasing of the pulse pressure. If you have a paradigm where changes in arterial pressure are incredibly important or changes in pulse pressure are really important, and you want to be 100% sure that any changes in pressure you see are because of real changes in pressure as opposed to maybe clots forming um, at the end of your catheter, and that's definitely one of the primary reasons why effectively I decided to move over to a solid state. Um, there are a large number of these available in large number of sizes and configurations. Um, the ones that I've used and the ones that I've found quite reliable are, are the Miller Microtip Solid State Catheters. Um, and you can see there's a huge variety of them, um, depending on whether you want to measure arterial pressure uh, in the rodents or you want to go up to large animals. Um, usually the scenario is that you have this solid state wire where the essential tip um, as showcased here is what measures the arterial pressure that goes inside the animal and the other end gets um, attached to a pressure box, which then gets converted. Um, there is a lead that goes out to your ACDC conversion that you can look up in your screen using either lab chart or spike or whatever program you might use. One of the main reasons why I made this switch from solid state uh, from um, the fluid filled to the solid state 
Um, and I'll talk a little bit more and show some uh, figures of the kinds of measurements you can get out is effectively my experimental paradigm necessitated um, blood pressure recording over days, um, continuously for a long period of time. Uh, and I was always a little bit concerned about what changes in pressure that you might see uh, might potentially be due to um, clots forming or effectively a change in pulse pressure, um, which is why even though a little bit more expensive, uh, we made the switch to go on to solid state catheters um, and it's been really helpful as I talk a little bit more. I think blood flow is one of those important uh, physiological variables. It's altered by a large number of mechanisms. Um, and we know that alterations in blood flow occur during both physiology and pathophysiology. Um, so you can have um, shifts in blood flow from certain organs um, depending on metabolic demand. Um, for example, if you exercise, you'd like more blood flow to go to your heart and you're exercising, exercising skeletal muscles, uh, and you probably have a decrease in blood flow, for example, to your internal organs, such as um, your gut or your kidney. Um, in addition to these um, normal physiological processes, you also get large changes in flow that might occur during pathophysiology. Um, this is one of the, the main interests that I have in trying to figure out um, whether the pathophysiology is associated with the changes in blood flow, or indeed if an alteration in blood flow might explain some of the pathophysiology. A large amount of my interest is in neural control of the circulation. Um, and while I'm really interested in how, for example, sympathetic nerves might affect the vasculature, at the end of the day, um, changes in sympathetic drive are one of many mechanisms um, that affect, um, that, that act to alter blood flow. Um, and I think based on that, um, in addition to um, direct recordings of autonomic nerve activity, uh, I've placed a lot of emphasis in my research question that includes measurement of blood flow to answer um, something that I think is quite important. Um, how to measure blood flow is, is, is again, a huge um, um, a topic. It can be measured non-invasively as well as invasively. You can have ultrasonic, you can have laser Doppler, um, you can have a huge variety of um, ways to measure blood flow. Um, traditionally, also you have the microsphere dilution technique, um, which can give you point estimates of blood flow. Um, but I think experimentally, in most cases, it's been replaced um, by measurements of blood flow that allow you to measure blood flow beat to beat. Uh, and while there might be a few um, products out in the market. Um, one of the ones that I've used pretty much since the start of my PhD actually uh, are transonic flow probes. Um, and the reason why um, I like them a lot is that they're reasonably reliable um, and effectively you can get beat to beat flow. Um, transonic has a huge variety of probes available. Um, and again, depending on what it is you want to use for, um, I'm sure um, the instrument staff can help you with that. Um, you can have really large probes that allow you to put this around the aorta to allow you to measure cardiac output. Um, you have a wide variety of probes um, that can allow you to measure blood flow to the kidney um, or to certain vasculature. Um, and of course, one thing um, that I've started incorporating a lot um, are some of these probes that have little flange that allows you to measure chondry blood flow, so blood flow going to the heart directly. Um, some of these are techniques that are very hard in rodents, um, and effectively that's one of the pushes that I've made towards trying to do this um, using transonic. Um, all of these probes effectively get connected to their flow meter, uh, and you can get um, effectively beat-to-beat -beat changes in flow through um, an artery of some sort for any period of time that you would like. Um, and there's some incredible advantage to the, to the use of transonic flow probes. Um, one thing that I guess I should comment on with transonic flow probes. Um, so one of the things that transonic um, really, um, I think is quite beneficial is that it can give you absolute flow measurements. Um, so effectively it can give you flow in terms of mils per minute or liters per minute, depending on what vessel you're measuring from. Um, but just a couple of caveats. Um, I think the flow probe assumes an exact diameter of the vessel to calculate flow. Uh, I won't go into the, the physics of how um, transonic um, measures flow, but effectively they're looking at the velocity of blood flow going through the artery. Uh, and, and to be able to be 100% accurate, really you need 
a flow probe that fits the diameter of the vessel 100% well. Um, and so the point I'm trying to make here is that there is some degree of variability to a group of animals um, that is not just because of changes in the flow to the vessel, but also might be because of very small but subtle changes to the diameter of the vessel. Um, the implantation of the flow probe is incredibly important um, because the flow probe needs to be exactly perpendicular to the flow profile. Um, and this is something, again, that if you choose to go down this pathway uh, of this flow probe, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of help and that will be available or um, feel free to email me and I'll have my email address um, included right at the end if you have any questions about how that's achieved. Uh, and some really minor things about technical issues, but these are really things that should be sorted out. Um, but you have to be mindful about calibration factors um, as well as flow probe length, just to allow you to ensure that when you have something that says it is a certain absolute level of blood flow, that that is exactly what you do. Um, one of the huge advantages I find with transonic flow probe, it is incredibly powerful for within animal experimental designs. Um, so even though you might have some degree of variability here, um, um, just because the animal is never going to have an exact diameter um, artery from animal to animal, but within animal is incredibly reproducible. Um, and that's definitely one thing that I've found um, really useful transonic flow probes. And I guess I'm talking about measurement of arterial pressure on large animals. Um, so just a little comment about why larger animals. Um, this is, um, I never started um, my research career in large animals, um, but once I started moving on to um, a lab that allowed me to um, work on large animals, I, I think if you have an interest in cardiovascular physiology, they give you um, a lot of benefits. Um, this is not to say that rodent um, instrumentation and rodent uh, protocols aren't important. They are as well. Um, but personally, um, I think if um, you want to be able to translate some of your findings, um, given that the heart rates are closer to humans and the cardiac output is closer to humans, um, there's some suggestion that larger animals, including people, um, are able to modulate cardiac output a lot more, whereas rodents are more predominantly reliant on changes in resistance. Um, so this is another reason why the use of large animals can be quite important. Um, if you're interested in things that are quite hard to instrument, for example, if you want to know um, changes in coronary blood flow, for example, um, that's incredibly difficult and I'd say technically quite um, hard in rodents, uh, whereas while difficult, it's still accessible for you in large animals. Um, and just a comment that I think some areas are better translatable to humans uh, with large animal cardiovascular physiology. Um, there are a couple of downsides, uh, and it's worthwhile mentioning it, but presumably you have to be aware of this. Um, one of them is cost in terms of um, keeping large animals around is more expensive than keeping rodents around. Not necessarily exorbitantly so, uh, depending on what rodents you work on. Um, but the other one that's really quite important is you really, you really need some quite specialized skills. Um, and the learning curve, if you want to get into large animal research, um, can be quite steep um, and, and can require quite a few years before uh, you get somewhere that's quite comfortable. Uh, but primarily because of the closeness, I think, of the large heart um, to humans, um, and because of my interest more in translational um, cardiovascular physiology, I think the large animal is a really important um, tool that I have. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit now um, about um, implantation of the arterial pressure probe as well as the flow probe. Um, kind of like I suggested, I'm not going to go into that much detail, um, primarily because there's some incredibly useful guides out there, um, especially if uh, your experimental paradigm is slightly different to what it is I might be doing. Um, but just to give you as an example, effectively, if you want to measure arterial pressure, uh, you want to be measuring it somewhere in the arterial tree. Um, so usually anywhere from the aortic arch right along the carotid artery, or if you go down, you can measure it somewhere in the femoral artery. And usually those are the two locations that are quite um, commonly looked at. Um, what we do is we implant the pressure probe in the carotid artery, or um, to be more clear, we make an incision in the neck um, where we can expose the carotid artery. Um, and then this um, arterial pressure catheter um, is tunneled into the artery and goes down towards the heart. So it's lying above the aortic arch, but somewhere in the artery. Um, 
There are multiple ways of doing this, and this is just a very simplified diagram um, where the carotid artery, um, the blood flow is coming from the heart and going towards the head. Um, in all of our experimental paradigms, we use a purse string suture, so effectively a little hole in the artery um, that allows us to insert this arterial pressure catheter um, that we can then tighten the suture. Um, some people, um, depending on the uh, artery they access, effectively tie off the artery and just leave um, the artery, um, the probe sitting um, further down the artery. But in our case, we use a purse string and that just means that depending on the size of the artery pressure probe you, you use, uh, when we use a reasonably thin one, um, we can measure pressure uh, and at the same time not be occluding any blood flow that's going past that artery. Um, and in our hands, um, we are reasonably confident that the pressure probe can sit in the artery uh, and not really occlude any flow because we have some uh, experimental paradigms where we utilize the flow going up to the head, for example, to try and activate some reflexes. Um, here is an example, and we've got a numerous numbers now because we've been using it for about the last um, maybe two and a half to three years um, of the arterial pressure profile in an animal where the probe was implanted about 10 days ago. Um, and so one of the beauties of this is that once the arterial solid state pressure probe is implanted, you can get very high fidelity uh, recordings of arterial pressure. You can see that you see the dichrotic notch in pretty much every beat. Um, the other advantage is if you have a fluid filled catheter, you've got to ensure that there is all, that, that arterial pressure catheter is always patent. You can do it a huge number of ways effectively by ensuring that this some infusion of heparinized saline through that um, um, fluid-filled catheter. Uh, and if for some reason that fluid infusion stops uh, and there's some amount of clot, then it makes it really hard to be able to use that fluid-filled catheter again. Um, whereas in this scenario, because it's solid state, it can stay in the animal and effectively give you very good measurements for as long as you want to. Um, we've gone on with some of our paradigms for about three to four weeks, um, and we're really um, happy um, in terms of the fidelity of the arterial pressure recordings that come out. Um, as an example, here is another case where we've got an animal that's been implanted with an arterial pressure probe, um, and I, I don't know exactly how many days, but I'd say it'd be probably a week. Um, you can see there's an arterial baseline level of arterial pressure. Um, and in this animal, we have been infusing phenylephrine, uh, which is an alpha vasoconstrictor intravenously for this period of time. Um, and you can see the slow and steady increase in arterial pressure. Um, the thing I want to, I guess, focus on is you can see this increase in pulse pressure, um, which allows you to be sure that this dose of phenylephrine is actually increasing pulse pressure. Um, sometimes changes in pulse pressure with the fluid filled catheter are a little bit harder to see, especially if that catheter has been in place for a long period of time. Um, so just another additional advantage of a solid um, state um, arterial pressure catheter where I think you can be more sure of changes in pulse pressure that you might see over a long period or an acute period of time. Okay. Um, the instrumentation for blood flow is a lot more complex because it depends really on where you want to implant your pressure probe. In other words, um, which blood vessel you want to go to, uh, whether it is the aorta to measure cardiac output or the renal artery to measure renal flow. Um, we routinely put um, these cardiac output flow probes in the ascending aorta or the pulmonary to record cardiac output now. Um, and here's just um, a schematic showing um, effectively, you need it to be reasonably perpendicular to be able to measure um, absolute blood flow. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of exactly how we implant flow probes in all the different blood vessels, um, but if that's an interest, um, I'll give you some examples of what we have done. And if you're really interested, um, feel free to come and get in touch with me, or I'm sure uh, any of the AD instrument staff would be able to help you with that. Um, and so here's an example of an animal. Um, this would be maybe about seven to 10 days after surgery, where we're measuring arterial pressure through a solid state pressure transducer, we're measuring beat to beat cardiac output, as well as coronary blood flow. So blood flow going to the heart. Um, 
So again, retraining the ability to measure coronary blood flow, um, which kind of, not that I need to justify it, but justifies the use of large animals in research. Um, the fact that um, you can measure these beat to beat in conscious animals that are sit, um, standing in their home crates or home cages, it's just a really big plus to be able to measure all of this. Um, we usually are just looking at changes in flow or cardiac output or pressure over a period of time, uh, but you can also look at some really in-depth analysis. Uh, for example, I've just blown up um, this exact figure here, so you can see the time relationship between the bloods coming out of your heart for cardiac output versus the arterial pressure trace uh, in the total artery, and you can see a little bit of a delay. Um, and the really important thing about coronary flow, of course, is that the increase in blood flow to the coronary artery really happens during relaxation of the heart. So it's during diastole that you get an increase in coronary flow. Uh, so these really little um, things that you can get out or measure with beat to beat measurement of coronary flow uh, is what makes um, um, these transonic flow probes um, quite important and useful. Um, there's a huge amount of research um, and I'll just comment on it, where people are looking at the profiles of coronary flow and how might that alter with physiology, and, and of course the use of these transonic probes really allows one to do that. Um, here's another uh, raw figure, if you like, where in this animal we've implanted again an arterial pressure probe, but we are simultaneously measuring blood flow to the renal artery, so measuring blood flow to the kidney, uh, as well as high and limb blood flow. So this flow probe is attached in the distal aorta, just post the renal artery, and effectively all the blood flow from there is going through the mesenteric to the skeletal muscle, uh, and effectively that allows you to look at skeletal muscle blood flow um, as well as renal blood flow and changes that might occur with um, different paradigms. Um, so effectively, just to highlight that you know blood flow is just this incredibly useful measure, I think, um, that you can measure in a whole host of organs depending on the experimental paradigm. Before I go on to talk about a couple of my research models uh, and how we have utilized these tools, um, just kind of want to reiterate um, tailoring your tools to research question. Um, this again, maybe is quite basic depending on who's attending the webinar, um, but I think it's, it's for you to decide um, what physiological variables are important to measure um, depending on your experimental protocol, whether it's acute, whether it's chronic, whether it's anesthetized or it's conscious, you can then decide um, whether you want to look at arterial pressure with a fluid filled or solid state, um, or indeed if you want to um, move towards the transonic flow probes. Um, and I think it all really depends on the research question that you're asking to, trying to answer. Um, and definitely my research questions have kind of um, slowly more, moved more towards how changes in flow um, might explain pathophysiology um, a little bit. That's why I've moved towards the solid state as well as um, transonic flow measurements. Um, so that's all I'm going to talk about in terms of um, the tools we have, the instrumentation techniques, um, as well as um, which tools you might pick. Uh, I'm then going to go on and give a couple of examples of a couple of um, models of pathophysiology that we have in the lab um, and try and explain how these tools have allowed us um, initially quite simplistically, but then um, with a lot more detail, try and unpick what's happening for, um, to explain the underlying physiology. So for a long period of my time uh, in my career, I've been really interested in heart failure, uh, which basically is a condition where the ventricles fail to eject adequate quantities of blood. Um, I'm going to focus uh, my work really on heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, uh, where effectively ejection fraction is below usually 40%, um, as opposed to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which also compromises comprise about 50% of the population, um, but that's a, a separate story that we're going to talk about today. Um, the symptoms when you have reduced station fraction of fatigue, breathlessness, and mental confusion. Um, within New Zealand, there's about 80,000 people, uh, and the numbers are similar uh, per capita for most countries. Um, it is the number one reason um, for admission to the hospital of people who are over 65. Um, and 6% of all acute admissions are attributed to this cohort. Um, the prognosis, um, I'm not sure you can say it's worse than many cancers. I think it's getting close to that of many cancers, um, but effectively 
the five-year mortality rates. Um, the 59% for men has come down a little bit, but still remains 45 to 50%, depending on which country you look at. Spokenos is quite worse um, for these patients. Uh, and of course, um, the reasons that cause it can be um, varied from ischemic heart disease to high blood pressure or cardiomyopathy. So within this paradigm of heart failure, if you look at these heart failure patients, one of the things that people have noticed for a long period of time is that if your heart rate is not variable, um, or effectively, if your heart rate variability is low, effectively it's associated with very poor outcomes. So this is just comparing um, a group of patients, stratifying them into whether their heart rates are really variable or very static and not vary a lot. If your heart rates don't vary a lot, the prognosis of the patient is quite poor of this cohort of patients. Um, and one of the things that drives this lower variability in heart rate is effectively impaired barrel reflex function. Uh, very effective the barrel reflex is unable to account for changes in blood pressure by alterations in heart rate. Um, and usually if you're developing a model of heart failure, one of the really important things you're interested in is whether barrel reflex control is impaired. Um, I won't go into the details of why we decided to choose the microembolization model of heart failure, but suffice it to say that we had a lot, large number of research questions that were looking at um, processes that occur that alter autonomic function in heart failure. Um, it's the research question just for this talk that we had was just the microembolization model of heart failure replicate the barrel reflex dysfunction that you see in a large number of heart failure patients. With the hypothesis that yes, it does impair it. Um, in order to be able to look at barrel reflex function, um, effectively you alter blood pressure and then you measure the effective heart rate. Um, in, in order to be able to do that, what we did was we utilized the solid state Miller pressure catheters that were implanted in these groups of animals to effectively look at that. Um, so just as the methods, effectively, um, these are sheep, large animals. Um, so once they come into um, the lab, they're given about a week to acclimatize. Uh, we then do about three embolizations a week apart. Um, so effectively in the embolization, a catheter is inserted in the coronary artery um, and really tiny microspheres are put into the coronary arteries that effectively cause a diffuse heart attack. Um, this might be repeated two or three times. So they have two or three MI episodes or myocardial infarction episodes. Um, then they are given a large period of time for heart failure to develop, which we can um, confirm using echocardiography. Once they come back, we instrument them in the animal. We instrumenting them with cardiac output and coronary blood flow um, in order to be able to answer some research questions. I'm not going to delve into those. Um, there's not enough time today, but effectively what I'll focus on um, is at the same time, we also put an arterial pressure probe. And once the animal has recovered from surgery, we can do some experiments in this scenario. We're looking to see if barrel reflex function is compared. We know that there's a good model of heart failure because the ejection fraction, the amount of blood pump out of the heart is reduced. The fractional shortening is reduced. Um, and the hearts tend to be a, large, a lot larger in these heart failure animals. There's a fair degree of fibrosis, uh, which we can confirm by looking under the microscope. You can see the amount of collagen uh, goes up in these animals. In addition to changes in heart parameters, you can see there is in this cohort of animals quite a large reduction in mean arterial pressure, as well as an increase in heart rate. So increase in heart rate and a decrease in arterial pressure is very reminiscent of what you might see um, in, in a patient cohort of heart failure. Um, and of course, we can measure uh, BNP and plasma norepinephrine levels, and these are elevated just as you'd expect in patients as well. In this paradigm, now we've established a model where um, it kind of fulfills, um, at least in terms of heart dysfunction, what you might expect to see um, in an animal model of heart failure. Um, and then we challenge these animals where we increase blood pressure um, using IV infusion of phenylephrine, which is very similar to what I showed you earlier. Um, and then we decrease blood pressure using sodium nitroprusside, and we can plot the resulting changes in heart rate. Um, so effectively in black is a control animal, and you can see as you increase blood pressure, heart rate falls, as you decrease blood pressure, heart rate um, increases. Interestingly, in this heart failure cohort of animals, this alteration in blood pressure um, around the resting value is low. So there's a reduced gain 
In other words, changes in arterial pressure don't affect um, heart rate as much, um, as well as you have a reduced lower blood. We can do this a different way, and effectively you're sitting at your control level of blood pressure. As you increase pressure by three or six millimeters of mercury, um, in the control animals, you've got a certain change in heart rate. Um, now that change in heart rate is diminished in the heart failure animals, whether you increase or you decrease blood pressure. So effectively, again, a different way of highlighting um, the previous scenario, just to reiterate that effectively you do see an impaired barrel reflex function um, in these animals. Um, and now having established the impaired barrel reflex function, we now have instrumented these animals with cardiac output, coronary flow, arterial pressure probes, um, and then we're going on to answer some research questions about, for example, um, the effects of alteration of respiratory sinus arrhythmia, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go into the details of all the research questions we have, um, but effectively, initially, we have the use of arterial pressure to give us a result, which is impaired barrier effects function, uh, and the use of these flow probes is going to allow us to really um, interrogate some important questions about physiology and heart failure. In addition to heart failure, um, one of the um, important um, arms, if you like, from a laboratory is they're looking at hypertension uh, because it's a huge problem affecting about 40% of adults. Uh, it's a leading risk factor for death and disability associated years lost. Uh, it is a huge cost. For every millimeter of mercury increase in blood pressure, the risk of death goes up. Uh, and for every decrease in blood pressure, you're able to do, um, you decrease your risk of ischemic heart events as well as a stroke uh, by substantial amount. Even though we have a large number of uh, medications available, unfortunately, about 60% of patients that are prescribed antihypertensives have inadequate blood pressure control. Uh, some of this is because some of these patients don't take their pills regularly. Some of it could be because the dose of the pill isn't right. And a small cohort of these patients, even though they take the pill and it is the right dose, um, they're just refractory to blood pressure um, control. In other words, the, the pills just don't work for them. Um, it is highly relevant, uh, but incredibly poor understood. And one of the issues with hypertension, as opposed to, for example, a heart attack, um, is that when you have hypertension, you don't really um, physically feel any different. Um, if anything, you might actually feel a little bit better because you have high pressure and therefore high flow to a lot of your organs. Um, and so it just means um, adherence to medication can be quite low. Why do a lot of these patients get hypertensives? One of the things we're really interested in is whether there is an increase in sympathetic drive um, that might go up to various organs. Um, we know that in humans, if we indirectly estimate um, cardiac sympathetic drive using the spillover technique. Um, there's a large increase in spillover. Um, one of the first studies we did was to try and directly record from sympathetic nerves going to the heart um, to ask the question if there is an increase in directly recorded cardiac sympathetic nerve activity during hypertension. Um, and of course, the hypothesis that we would see an increase. Um, so very quickly running through these methods. In this case, we have got a group of normal and a group of hypertensive sheep. Uh, where after the animals come in, it's a two kidney, one clip model of renal vascular hypertension. So effectively, we clip one of the renal arteries, um, let the animal go for about two and a half weeks, and we're recording um, blood pressure using a solid state um, catheter, um, as well as we're going to um, record some sympathetic drive. Uh, you can see that after the artery is clipped, um, the weight of the kidney falls, whereas the contralateral artery tends to compensate. Uh, and we have a large increase in blood pressure with no changes in heart rate. Now you could probably potentially see this difference with fruit filled catheters, and people have seen this before. Um, but the use of the solid state really gives us uh, a little bit more reassurance um, that um, the measures of arterial pressure we have, um, especially for some chronic experiments, and I'll come to that in a little bit, um, are, are real. You can give ganglionic blockade that effectively blocks sympathetic drive to the, all the organs. And you can see the drop in blood pressure is larger in the hypertensive animals. Um, and that's because if you directly measure cardiac sympathetic drive, so this is arterial pressure. Uh, there are these bursts of activity going along the cardiac sympathetic nerve. Uh, 
Uh, and you can see just in this animal, the number of births seems to be elevated uh, to the heart, but if anything seemed to be reduced to the kidney, um, and our mean data effectively replicate that. So initially we showed that this model of renal vascular hypertension is an increase in cardiac sympathetic drive, um, but actually a reduction in renal sympathetic drive. This increase in cardiac sympathetic drive appears to at least modulate some degree of heart rate in these hypertensive animals. Okay, so we established this model of heart failure, looked at some changes in sympathetic drive. The second question is, well, what might be mediating this hypertension um, in this model? Um, and one of the things we were interested in were the carotid bodies. So the carotid body, a pair of organs located at the bifurcation um, in the neck, um, at the bifurcation of the internal and the external carotid artery, and effectively they sense um, changes in hypoxia, changes in pH, changes in PO2, PCO2, uh, and some recent evidence that they're polymodals because they can sense a whole host of things. Um, there was some evidence in Norton studies that interruption, so removal of the carotid body or interruption of the carotid sinus nerve might reduce blood pressure in rodent models of hypertension. Um, so we want to look at what is the role of the carotid chemoreceptors in mediating hypertension. And our hypothesis was that if we cut these carotid chemoreceptors, we would reduce blood pressure. A very similar methods, except um, in this case, we're primarily looking at renovascular hypertension, um, um, where we are clipping these animals, but at the end, we either do a sham or um, a denervation of the carotid sinus nerve, um, and then look at changes in blood pressure. One of the reasons why the solid state pressure catheter became incredibly important is we were measuring arterial pressure for a long period of time before the sham or the carotid sinus denervation. Um, the first couple of animals we did with fluid-filled catheters, we saw changes, but uh, also associated with a change in pulse pressure. Um, so the one of the worries was also with the fluid filled catheter was whether any changes we see might be reflected to an increased incidence of clots in the fluid filled catheter, which is why we made the shift to um, the solid state catheter. The way we test for denervation of the carotid bodies is effectively we give uh, a stimulus called carot um, potassium cyanide. Um, and if the carotid sinus nerve is in intact, there's an increase in blood pressure. Um, once we have effective uh, carotid sinus innovation, blood pressure doesn't increase as much. What was really interesting to see was in the group of animals where the carotid sinus nerve was cut, we see this large reduction in mean arterial pressure after the carotid sinus nerve is cut. But if you expose the area but don't cut the nerve, you don't see any change in mean arterial pressure. Effectively indicating that removal of the carotid chemoreceptors can decrease blood pressure this was quite a puzzling result for me. I mean, people have shown this in rodents before, um, but the puzzling result for me was why should the carotid chemoreceptors be involved um, when the insult is happening in the kidney? I mean, the assumption is that usually the blood pressure would go up um, because of renal ischemia, because of the renal angiotensin system, which might increase um, sympathetic drive. Um, but why the carotid chemoreceptors were hyperactive was always a puzzle for me. Um, this is just looking at paraflex control. I'll just skip over this. Um, and really, we kind of thought a lot about why the carotid chemoreceptors might be hyperactive. In animal models of heart failure, where cardiac output is really low, you see a decrease in carotid blood flow. Uh, and the assumption is that that carotid blood flow decrease might also decrease blood flow to the carotid body, which might be why the carotid chemoreceptors are really in. Um, um, the activity of the carotid chemoreceptors is really elevated in heart failure. So we chose to look at this um, in our hypertensive model as well. This is just hemodynamic variables. I'm just highlighting mean arterial pressure in the normotensive and hypertensive group. You can see in the hypertensive group, mean arterial pressure is greater. To our surprise, carotid blood flow was actually significantly decreased in this hypertensive group. Really expect this because normally you expect if mean arterial pressure is greater, um, if anything, blood flow should stay the same um, or maybe even increase slightly. But we saw a large decrease in carotid blood flow as well as a decrease in carotid vascular conductance. 
So here's where the use of, the, for example, the transomic flow probes really allows us to have some insight into why the carotid chemoreceptors might be really important, at least in this model of hypertension. Um, and the solution um, or the likely solution might be that renal vascular hypertension is associated with a decrease in carotid blood flow, which might be one mechanism um, that increases or, or elevates hypertonicity of the carotid body. So just to conclude kind of the scientific talk, um, using the tools, we've shown that renal vascular hypertension is sort of a significant increase in directly recorded cardiac sympathetic drive. Um, if we cut the carotid sinus nerves, you can reduce mean arterial pressure. Uh, and the use of solid state pressure probes where you don't really see any difference in pulse pressure over time allows us to be really sure of this result. Um, and of course, the measurement of carotid blood flow and conductance um, allows us to posit that it might be that a decrease in carotid blood flow uh, may underlie the hypertonicity of the carotid body. Um, I'd just like to finish by acknowledging a large number of people who have been involved in a lot of these projects. Um, so in terms of research from the University of Auckland, um, postdocs, um, as well as uh, PhD um, and postgraduate students, um, Dr. Nigel Lieber, who's a clinician who helps a lot with the heart failure project, technical staff, and of course, a huge number of funding sources uh, without which this work wouldn't be possible. Um, and finally, I'd just like to end by thanking again, um, Amy and Nick for giving me this opportunity to talk a little bit of my research, um, as well as highlighting the use of tools, such as the arterial pressure, um, as well as uh, the transonic flow probes um, to be able to look at different um, research questions. Um, if you have any questions that you come up with later, um, I'm happy to be contactable by email. Um, you can just um, click me an email. I'm happy to get into any discussions or collaborations if required. Um, almost all of this work has already been published. Um, there's some upcoming, but if you're really interested, you can look up me on PubMed if you want to get a few more details about either experimental paradigms or the use of these tools. Um, so I'm going to end it there uh, and happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Dr. Maria Ramachandra. If I could just share my screen, I will also have some contact details for our team as well. Um, and we are open to questions. Just waiting on them. Start off in, I suppose. Um, are you also looking into um, to um, different types of you know low active frequency, like low frequency or high frequency, very low, yeah, you know, very high frequency, depending on if that has any sort of effect with the blood pressure regarding the heart okay. rate variability. Just with the heart rate variability, are you also interested in to the uh, low frequencies or very low frequencies that could be affecting? Um, uh, yeah, so um, we haven't, I haven't really looked at high or low frequency oscillations in blood pressure. Um, I know uh, quite a few people who do that quite routinely. Um, and of course, that would be quite useful to have really good measures of blood pressure in that scenario. Um, so I haven't really looked at low or high frequency in arterial pressure. Um, there's a whole host of papers that look at low and high frequency power in heart rate, um, and I've published a little bit on that. Um, I'm not that convinced that low frequency oscillations in heart rate variability tell you much about sympathetic drive, um, and I've got a few publications around that. Um, so I'm interested in heart rate, low and high frequency variability, um, in, in its use as, a, as an experimental tool, just because it's so easy to get heart rate from, especially for clinical patients. Uh, but blood pressure, not as much. 
And we have one now from an anonymous attendee. Um, I'll just read you out the question right here. I'm curious about the solid state versus fluid filled catheters. How much does artery size affect how good your fluid filled catheters signal is? Or is it that your experience that solid state is generally better? Is there any function of experimental of experiment length? Um, thanks for that question. Um, so how does artery size affect fluid filled catheters? Um, I mean, theoretically, um, I would assume that the larger the artery size, uh, potentially your fluid filled catheter will work better for a longer period of time. Um, that's an assumption. I'm not sure if that's true. Um, usually we go for the carotid artery, which would probably be one of the larger arteries uh, in the sheep, and I suspect in a whole host of animals as well. Um, and even with the carotid artery, um, there are a whole host of factors as to why food filled catheters don't necessarily work that well. Um, but one of the primary things is that the longer you wait, the more the time for something to go wrong. Um, one of the things that happens with fluid-filled catheters, you've got, if you've got to be constantly and continuously perfusing this fluid-filled catheter with enough heparinized saline to ensure that you don't clot. Um, and if for any reason um, that gets interrupted or for any reason that gets blocked for any period of time, especially in the arterial side of the circulation, um, it makes it difficult um, and it makes it quite um, it, it makes me question results sometimes. So in my hands, at least for, for experimental paradigms I use where I'm going more than a week, um, I just think through, through, uh, solid state catheters are better. Um, and it took me a while to be convinced, um, if I'm honest, um, but now that we've made the change, um, I think it's very hard for us to go back um, just be, because we can see it work so well. Yes, I can attest to the same thing as you have right here. I did quite, quite a lot of um, rat studies and where we had fluid filled catheters as well. And we also had blockages and you can see that the effects that has on blood pressure and also the actual trace itself. Uh, I can ask another question if you like right here. Yeah. How, in terms of just your, um, how easy was it actually to use the, uh, the, the flow probes and the, the, themselves? Like, was it was it much of a learning curve there you found or was it just you know, fairly easy to even teach your students? Um, I think with the flow probes, it depends a little bit on which flow you want to measure. Um, I'm assuming some underlying level of um, surgical expertise. Um, so you're able to, um, in the anesthetized animal, go in and expose the artery. Um, if you're um, looking at probes that are quite small, um, for example, the renal artery, um, skeletal muscle flow, um, I think it's incredibly simple. Um, I, I think um, in some ways, um, putting an arterial pressure probe, I think would take more time and potentially be uh, more problematic, I suspect, than putting in a flow probe, for sure. Um, I think some flow probes are a little bit harder. Um, so I think if you want to put uh, a carotid art, um, sorry, not a carotid artery, um, a cardiac output flow probe, so going around the aorta or the pulmonary artery, um, those can be a little bit more difficult um, just because you're dealing with a beating heart um, constantly. Um, and also, uh, it's a little bit harder to uh, be sure that the probe kind of fits around the aorta quite well. Um, so those require a little bit more time, um, but I would say they're still incredibly easily doable. I mean, you might have to do a couple of uh, acute anesthetized experiment to just um, um, get into the swing of things if you like, um, but I didn't find them that hard. Um, the only caveat to all of these would probably be Connery flow. Um, so Connery flow is hard, not because the probe is hard to use, uh, but I think what it is you're trying um, to clear the coronary artery um, is a little bit more difficult because of the beating heart, uh, as well as the potential that if there is a bleed, um, it can be quite fatal in terms of the animal. Um, so the coronary flow, maybe you need um, a little bit more guidance 
um, or potentially to go somewhere, actually learn the technique. Uh, but all the other flow probes, um, I think if you have some level of surgical skill, um, I think they'd be incredibly simple. Thank you, Maria. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, how do you make sure that there's no blood clot when you inserted the catheter in the, in the particular artery? Did heparin would help at this point? Um, so I'm not sure if the question refers to um, a fluid filled or a solid state, um, but I can answer both. Um, so in a solid state, um, effectively, as soon as you put it in um, and close the purse string off, um, usually you'd see um, blood flowing past that artery um, effectively. Um, so you're reasonably confident that there's no blood clot. Um, with the fluid filled, if you have a clot that forms exactly at the tip of the sensor, um, then my assumption is that that would affect your blood pressure reading. Um, but in the animals we've done in the last two and a half, three years, I don't think we've ever had a scenario where there's been um, a blood clot on the solid state pressure tip. Um, in terms of fluid filled catheters, um, as soon as they're inserted into the artery, effectively you can flush in and out. Um, and effectively, as long as it bleeds back well and you can flush in well, um, you're kind of confident that there is no blood clot. Um, I think if you can't withdraw or you can't flush in, um, clearly there's a blood clot. You have scenarios where you can flush in, but you can't withdraw. Um, and I think those scenarios as well, for me, tend to be a bit problematic because my assumption is there is some clot or potentially a flap of a clot right at the tip of the fluid filled catheter. Um, and usually in my experiences in those scenarios, you can kind of flush heparin and keep it patent. Um, but usually as you keep flushing, your pulse pressure trace improves and tends to degrade over time. Um, Thank you, Rahit. Yep. Uh, we have another question here by James Hong. Have you tried using LA telemetry transmitters, uh, which allows a more natural animal behavior and work with conscious animals? If yes, have you seen any significant difference in data? Um, so I haven't used LA telemetry transmitters. Um, I have experience with some telemetry um, pressure transmitters, and that's mainly um, what used to be telemetry research, and now I guess it's the Millar, or used to be Millar, and maybe it's changed. Um, but once I move to the large animals, um, we don't really use telemetry at all. Um, and just to make the distinction, I don't think you need telemetry to do conscious animal experiments, um, definitely not in the large animals. So all of the data we see, um, are in conscious animals for long periods of time. Uh, um, it's easier perhaps than rodents, um, but you can do conscious animal experiments without the need for telemetry, um, which is why we haven't made the change. Um, I know pressure is available with, with telemetry. Um, and last I saw even flow is available with telemetry. Um, it was something we considered, but um, conscious animals meaning free roaming. Um, that, that's, a, that's a fair point. Um, so they're not quite free roaming, um, but they are tethered. Um, so all the probes come out of the back of the animal um, and go together in the probe right to the back where they connect to various uh, things. Um, we very rarely would allow the animals to roam for um, in large areas um, that potentially is an experimental paradigm so you can use. Uh, but effectively, they're, they're, they're allowed movement within their crate, um, but not enough for them to be able to get access to the probes coming out. Thank you for that answer, Graham. And just waiting another minute if anyone else has any questions. Otherwise, of course, uh, you can email us or Rohit directly. I can ask you one more question regarding another catheter. How long, um, how, in terms of durability, how long um, does a catheter last, in your, in your opinion? Um, so, in an individual animal, um, we put these catheters for 
some of our protocols have gone up to maybe three, four weeks, um, and we find them reasonably durable. Um, some catheters are meant to be reused. Some catheters are meant to be single use only. Um, but in our hands, even the single use catheters, you can um, keep using them repeatedly. Um, I think you've got to be very careful with that, um, um, the solid state tip, uh, which is what measures pressure. Uh, because I think when, especially at the end of the experiment, when you get these probes out, if you damage them in any way at all, then I think it's likely that it's not going to work again. Um, and that's taken a little bit of, um, um, I guess, upskilling in, in, in our scenario where especially students can be a little bit more rougher. Um, but I think if you're careful with it, um, we just keep reusing them. Um, both the tip as well as where um, the wire kind of joins up into where it gets connected to the cable to the box. Um, I think those are two kind of, if you like, points they've got to be quite careful about. Um, we've used them in multiple animals. Um, the thing that um, we do quite routinely uh, is we check the zero um, before implantation as well as the end when it comes out. Um, we see very minimal changes in zero levels, um, which is again, another reason why we are quite confident that um, the pressure levels we see are quite good. Um, Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dr. Rohit Ramachandra, for the webinar and to answer these questions for us. And uh, once again, contact uh, Rohit directly or our team if you're interested in any of our products. So we'll be uh, finishing off now. And uh, this is, of course, recorded and we'll be sending it to everyone. So once again, thank you, Rohit. And uh, we'll see you all again. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Oh, okay. Bye -bye.